my thing. So, hey everybody, today we're talk going to talk to Mark Childers with Classic Home Renovations. Mark is a local general contractor that has experience with renovation as well as new construction. And since the market for listing homes is so tight, I thought it'd be a good idea to talk to someone that might be able to guide people in the right direction if they're looking to build or take on a major remodel. So without further delay, please welcome Mark Childers to the podcast. Thanks for having me on, Mike. Yeah, thanks for being on, Mark. Um, full disclosure, Mark is uh, Mark goes to Rotary with me and is a good friend of mine, but he's also done work for me personally and has always done a really good job and uh, always enjoy working with him. So I appreciate you, appreciate you being on. So why don't, well, likewise. Why don't we uh, just kind of get get right into this? So let's let's start with some vocabulary. Um, What's the difference between a spec house and a custom house? Well, Mike, a spec house uh, is shortened for speculative, and that's that house that a builder is going to build on his own dime and then hope to sell it at a profit when he's finished with it. The thing about spec homes is uh, ideally for the builder, after he gets it framed in and a customer can see what the house is going to be. Uh, may, maybe he gets a contract and then the customer gets to finish it out with their finished surfaces versus a custom house where you, you contract the builder to build a specified house for you. Uh, it, it's most likely going to be on land that you've purchased and uh, you get with the builder, uh, go over the plans and, and he gives you a contract price for uh, building one specific house. Okay. So um, that, I thought that was important because a lot of times you'll hear people talk about that. And uh, I think a lot of times the public doesn't really know what people are talking about. So um, I think it was good just to kind of start out by clearing that, clearing that up. So for the purpose of discussion, we're going to kind of go more on the custom house side and, and with kind of how we're going to frame the discussion going forward. But so if someone wants to have a custom home built, uh, where, where do they start? Do they start looking at lots? Do they start looking at plans? Where do you recommend that people kind of get the ball rolling? I think a lot of people think that they should do the plans first, but you really need to pick out that lot and have the plans drawn to it. Um, First of all, the house has to fit on the lot. Uh, second, the, the lay of the lot, maybe you pick a lot to be perfect for a daylight basement. Um, and if, if that's important to you, you need to get one with the, the grade that falls off to the back. So um, you can find an architect uh, on your own. You can go to the builder. He is probably already working with one or two architects or home designers. You do not have to have an architect for a residential residence. So uh, there are plenty of good home designers out there that traditionally will be less expensive than an architect. Okay, that's good to know. I, do, I mean, and I, not to hold anybody to it, but like any idea like the, the cost range from for hiring an architect or a designer, like what, what someone would expect for something like that. Like I said, not, no one's going to hold you to a price, but just kind of a, a sure. wide range. Uh, different folks work different ways. Sometimes it's just a square foot price and more architects work that way versus the home designers. The one that we use kind of figures how much time that he will have in it and he'll give you a range. Most of the remodel projects that I work with, you're looking at between two and $3,000 for an addition. You know, the home plans that we recently bought, uh, I, I think we gave, I, I think about 2,500 for those. Okay. Uh, one thing you may want to do if you want to cut your cost a little bit, is a lot of them will have catalogs of home plans that uh, they, they have already done. It's their intellectual property. And maybe you can pick one out of his catalog 
and just just modify it to suit your needs would probably uh, save money in most cases. Something I looked at once uh, I, when I was thinking about building, um, there were a bunch of websites out there that you go on and look at house plans. Do you do you think that's a good way to go, or you think it's better? You're better off talking to a designer and just kind of letting them guide you along the way. Personally, I think you're better off talking to a designer because they build locally. Uh, they they know what the local codes are. Uh, you know, a lot of people take an idea from one of the design magazines and uh, you do have to keep in mind that's the intellectual property of the person that drew it. But if it's just a basic, here's for the most part what I want um, and it's not a verbatim copy, your home designer or architect could use that for a starting point. Um, just to kind of get, get I don't the see conversation real, going. I'm sorry. I said kind of just to get the conversation going at least so you can kind of determine kind of exactly. what direction you want to go to. Yeah. And the, the ones that you do buy out of those books, um, I, I don't see that they're really that much less expensive. Um, I, I think you'll pay between 1500 and $2,000 for those, but any changes are really going to cost you. I think that's where they really make their, their profit on okay. those. That's good. Um, we kind of went into it a little bit, um, but uh, what things do people need to look out for when they're picking a lot? Um, you know, at what point should, and, and at what point should they get the builder involved? Uh, the first major thing is, uh, utilities, you know, are, are you going to have city water there? Are you going to have city sewer? Um, if it is city services, uh, obviously you're going to have tap fees, but typically that's a lot less than digging a well. Um, you, you have to look at the grade of that lot and find out what depth those taps are at. So say you do have city sewer available, uh, it, it's a great thing to hook up to that, but you have to make sure that you can gravity feed uh, to the tap or, or you're going to have to have a pump put in. Uh, lot lines are very important. That's, that's another reason it's good to pick the lot first. And those uh, setbacks, uh, they, they vary depending on the municipality. So, you know, you'll want a good site plan uh, and, and your architect or home designer can, can draw that to uh, the site plan just draws out the, the lot and then it, it puts in the setbacks and like a overall picture of where the building sits to, to make sure that you're not encroaching on the setbacks. Okay. You probably need to look at uh, something I found too is uh, on land is to make sure you look at the setbacks. The subdivision even may have different sub uh, setbacks than even the city or the county does too. That's a so great that's point. You're, you're absolutely right. So you need to look at those covenants and uh, not just for setbacks. You know what what are the uh, what what are the materials that are allowed? Do they allow vinyl? Does it have to be brick or stone? Uh, certainly, most HOAs, if they have covenants. Uh, have a square footage minimum. So uh, that, that's a great point, Mike. You, you got to comb through those covenants and make sure that, uh, that you comply. No, it's, it's, it's super um, important. We've even had somewhere, um, you know, that you have to get the plans. Like if you bought, if you're going to build the house, you have to get the plans approved by the developer too. And sometimes sure. that can be, a, um, you know, a whole set of hoops that you have to run through because a lot of times you don't really know exactly what you're going to build on it until after you buy it. And so if, if, if the house you want to build on it, you can't build it um, without that approval. It can kind of make it tricky. I had a couple of times where someone wanted to buy the lot and then they had the plans for the house they wanted to build. And then the developer wouldn't let them build that house there. And so they ended up not buying the lot. So uh, 
that's also one of the There's just details like some subdivisions won't let the garage door face the street yep and uh you, you want to find that out on the front end not the back <laughs> yeah. end it'll be it'll be really expensive when you start building it and they tell you you got to move <laughs> exactly but then uh the next thing is uh the the perk test um if you're not familiar with the perk test uh you typically hire a backhoe. Not many people dig them by hand, but but you could. And uh, you dig uh, test holes. And the term is a little bit misleading. They, they don't fill them with water and see how long it takes to, to drain. They'll have a, uh, someone from the county will come look at the soil composition that you took out of the hole basically. And based on that soil structure, they'll determine what what kind of septic system you you can put on that lot there's a lot of there's a lot of lots that are like that like we have for sale that have like perk tests on them like the, where they've done it how good is it how long is a perk test good for do you know if somebody does one or wow. is it good for you? i i can't really answer that question mike i i Probably I very thinking because the soil composition isn't going to change. So I would think once you get it, it would be good. I mean, you you've paid for it. Um, the the only thing similar to that is once you pull a building permit, you have to have one inspection per year to keep that permit alive. Okay, but as as far as perk test I, I don't really know okay good good question well we can we can find out and uh i can put it in show notes later so uh there I, you go. I get a definitive answer but i think more more likely i think it's probably going to vary on the municipality you know and or the county that you're in it may change um what happens if you find a lot that uh let's say that the county does um a perk test then let's say you're planning on building a pretty large house, you wanted a four bedroom house and the county does a perk test and all the perks for like a three bedroom house with a standard system. Is there anything people can do to um, maybe get a little bit more out of it? Is, you know, is there anything? You know, there, there are more sophisticated systems that sometimes they can use, um, but typically they're more expensive, but, uh, there there are some more expensive alternatives obviously they try to get you into just a conventional uh system but uh there are more expensive alternatives if that's just the the dream house on the dream lot that that you have to have so what kind of things do you think people forget to take into account when they decide to build um, you know, there's uh, just little things that you can do for little or almost no cost that, uh, I, a, a good builder should be advising you on. It's like, um, with, with home automation now and, uh, home networking, if, if you've got a three story house and do not put a little chase from your basement up to your attic space, you, you probably missed a great opportunity to do something that could save you a ton in the future and cost you almost nothing at construction. Uh, typically you take a two inch PVC pipe and just run it between the floors. So, so you have that access. Um, another, opportunity versus a typical HVAC system. If, if you're doing a bonus room, you, you think about it, you're putting an air handler in an attic that could get 140 degrees and then you're trying to run 70 degree air through a duct that's insulated to maybe R4. Um, if, if you're doing a bonus room, it's way better just to insulate that room well 
and uh, a mini split is like an air handler that hangs on the wall. So that air isn't really conditioned until it gets to the head. You run a line set, not a duct. So you're just really running your refrigerant to that head unit and you're making the cold air in the envelope, as we call it, in the, the space that's already insulated. So you, you, you don't have this air handler sitting out in a hot attic trying to make cold air and then distributing through the attic. Now, that makes a lot of sense because uh, even when I go, like when I show houses, I have a bonus room, especially over the garage like that. That room always seems to struggle, you know. Um, when it's, it's got always a five to ten degrees hotter on, on the hottest days, and especially if it's tied into the rest of the house system and not on its a separate thing. So um, it can really, exactly. uh, it really struggles. But uh, yeah, a lot of houses I, I'll see they'll put like window air conditionings in the uh, air conditioning units even in those rooms, just so it can kind of keep up. Um, if people use those rooms a lot. And I, I guess that's why it makes a lot of sense. I would also throw out there too is, um, especially the way things are going, you talked about technology, but like make sure wherever you're gonna build, make sure you actually have access to internet. Um, I, you know, I've had you know, a couple people where, you know, they found a friend that found the perfect lake, lake lot. And then when it came time for them to get internet, end up having to go with like satellite internet because uh, it wasn't offered where that house was. Um, and so right. you have to kind of, you know, and, and more and more we're dependent on that. And uh, your smart house isn't gonna work real well if it's not connected to the internet. So uh, you wanna make sure that you have that. And something I wish the municipalities and everybody would really, I think there is a focus on it, but it really needs to, they need to really push more to make sure that we can get it out more to our, to our rural areas because uh, you know, it might allow us to build a little bit more. The only other thing I would add, Mike, is I would encourage people just to think ahead, not just next year, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years even. Um, you know, it, it's not that much more to put a 36 inch door on all the interiors. Uh, if you're going to stay in that house for wheelchair access, um, there, there, there's a trend where people want to stay in their homes as long as they can. And a whole lot easier to do it when you build it than try and go in and crease a door frame later. Uh, you could even go ahead and put plywood on your bathroom walls next to your toilet. Um, for, for future grab bars. Um, that way you don't have to worry about hitting a stud. You're into solid wood no matter where you go. So for the cost of a sheet of plywood, go ahead and do that in your showers and in your toilet area. And then you don't have to remember 10 years back, uh, where did I put that blocking? Or even for a short term, I, we, we just bought a house not that long ago. And one of my projects has been replacing all the towel bars and it'd be really nice if I could just drill right into that instead of having to use those stupid little um, which I'm going to give a piece of advice to everyone if you put on a towel bar or a toilet paper roll take the hardware that they give you and throw it away and actually go out and buy actual hardware to put that stuff in because every time I use it it falls apart so just as a, yeah. as a, a seasoned homeowner um, uh, not to steal any of your builder thunder, you know, because I think it's pretty low level uh, stuff, but uh, throw that stuff yeah. away because it is complete junk. So, <laughs> exactly. But, no, yeah, if you think about it, that little plastic sleeve anchor that, that you get, it, it's just holding drywall. It will hold the weight of the towel bar, and that is all. But, uh, all right. Um, let's see. And then, um, Let's see. All right. So let's move on a little bit more to like uh, renovations. That's kind of a little bit more in your wheelhouse. I think you do a little bit more of that, but um, you're knowledgeable on all these things. That's why I love, always love talking to you and bending your ear on things. But um, any advice to people? Uh, one of the reasons, I guess, why we wanted to do this is just to kind of open up people's ideas because a lot of times you know, people are looking for houses now and they're struggling to actually find 
um, you know, what they want. And so they say, well, maybe I can build it or maybe I can buy a house that needs work, but I really like the location and do a remodel on that. So do you have any advice for people that are, that are thinking in those terms? So like, you know, and they've already got like, you know, from a, you know, hopefully they've got a, a really good agent that says, Hey, if you fix this up and you know, this is what this house will be worth if you do this, this, and this. So they're already going to have that information. What kind of stuff do, do, do you think they need to take into account when they're looking at a house like that? Uh, Mike, if I hate it when folks have already bought the house and then they want to call me because I, I break their hearts a lot of times. Um, <laughs> As you know, home building, remodeling is relatively expensive and remodeling way more expensive than new construction, just nature of the beast. Um, and, and your agents are, are great about bringing me in. If somebody's just looking at a house, I'm, I'm happy to give them an hour if, if I can help them make the right decision on that house. But if, if you're uh, thinking major remodel, go ahead and talk to a remodeler first because there are things that sometimes homeowners come up with that sure we could do it if the account is big enough, but uh, they, they just typically don't know what things are called. So uh, my number one advice would get a remodeler in as early as you can. Uh, my second piece of advice is make sure you like him or her because you're going to be spending some time together. <laughs> um, remodeling is, is a stressful time. I always joke before somebody signs the contract, I tell them folks love to see us come, but they really love to see us go. Uh, you think about it. We're in your space. We're uh, making noise, creating dust, uh, upsetting your, your schedule. So you, you want to make sure that you get somebody professional that is going to run a schedule so he can minimize the time that he has your house torn apart. Um, other than that, be patient in the planning phase. That's the best time money you will spend on that project bar none. Um, particularly in a, a remodel, if you have to live in it, um, you, you want to get those details down early on so, so you can plan for them and make the project go smoother. Um, you know, any change that doesn't have to be a change, any details that you can talk about, get up front, it's usually always going to be cheaper for you. So just spend that time. I, I, I know folks get ready to go. They've waited three years. They've got their money now and they're chomping at the bit to start. But if, if they'll just pause a, a little bit and okay, have we thoroughly gone over these plans? Have we uh, given our remodeler enough time to get a good thorough estimate on it. Um, just planning phase is, is a, way more important than the, the actual construction. Well, that's definitely good advice. And uh, we've, we've definitely been there over the years where you kind of like you're, you know, you, like you said, you get excited, you, you know, you saved up your money, you're ready to go. And then, um, you know, it's like, all right, well now, now we gotta wait and uh, until it's, it's really gonna get done. So uh, yeah. I, I agree, I think being patient, I think is gonna be one of the biggest things because, you know, there's, there, for, for good or bad, I think we have a lot of really good contractors in our area, um, but there's not a lot. And so um, I think, you know, if you wanna get the job done and you wanna get it done right, I think you need to really take your time finding the right person and then being ready to wait for that right person. And sometimes, you know, you might have to wait six months or a year before you can really even do the project. So uh, you're right. There are a lot of good builders and most of us have pretty long wait list right now, but uh, yeah, it's, you know, there, there's always that guy that can come along saying, 
sure, I can start in two weeks and I can do it cheaper. Has, has he taken the time to know what the project really gonna cost? Um, yeah, just be aware the guy that tells you just what you wanna hear because normally that's where you get the, the nightmare stories. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's it definitely, <laughs> we've been there and, uh, you know, I, I hear the horror stories from other people. So, uh, and again, that's why I wanted to do this today too, just to kind of, to arm the consumer with what they need so that they're prepared. So they're not, you know, if somebody comes up and says, hey, it's going to take me a while to do this and maybe they're prepared for that or that, you know, um, I mean, we kind of talked a little bit earlier, um, you know, like availability of supplies. I mean, talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, what's kind of going on with all, you know, with COVID. I mean, it's kind of slowed down some of that stuff. What kind of, what can you tell us about that? Oh, my COVID has caused us pain. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just getting the manufactured goods. And if, if I knew at the start of the project, which one's going to, give us the hold up. You could plan around it, but usually it's not that smooth. Usually you get a commitment date and then the supply chain says, sorry, it's going to be two more weeks. Uh, just uh, cra crazy stuff like uh, a customer wanted a particular cultured stone and the, the lead time was like six weeks on it. And then we found a source and the, the stone was made sitting in the factory, but they, they said, we, we don't have people to load the trucks. We can only load so many trucks a day. So it was still 10 days wow. after we found the other source and the stuff was made sitting at the factory. So just uh, be prepared. Uh, windows are taking longer garage doors cabinets um it, the appliances that I, I'll, I'll throw that out there appliances are taking longer too we've had several appliances. people appliances um d dishwashers people needed dishwasher i have family that wanted a refrigerator and they ended up having like they had to buy like a tiny kids refrigerator basically temporarily because the refrigerator that actually fit the space wasn't going to be ready for months. So you're exactly uh, right. Um, yeah, yeah the, the story that I get most consistently from the supply chain is, well, the kids aren't in school. So the parents have to stay home with the kids. So people can't come to work to make ABC good. Uh, Interesting. It's amazing how everything's so interconnected with everything that, that happens and it, it, it ends up hitting you places that you don't really expect. It is, like I said, it, uh, if, if you knew which one's gonna be the hiccup at the start, you, you can just shift the schedule, but usually it's okay, it's, it's supposed to be here next week and make the call to follow up and Oh, well, it's going to be two weeks after that. So it's just the crazy world we live in today. Well, hopefully uh, things will keep getting better. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's been really slow, a lot slower than I even expected. I mean, when this whole thing started, we're like, all right, you know, like they did that like 45 days to slow the spread. I was like, all right, yeah, let's get, you know, get this out of the way. And, you know, six months later, we're still here. So hopefully, you know, my hope is that maybe early, by early next year, Maybe, you know, and like I said, things are open up a little bit here and there, but, you know, hopefully early next year, we can kind of get back to a little bit of normal um, and that sort of thing. So, well, that takes me into our next part of the, the uh, show that I like to do a, a little bit more lighthearted and a little bit more personal kind of things to, to talk yeah. about. And it gives a chance to talk about some restaurants and TV shows that people watch and that sort of thing. So with the fact that restaurant choices are pretty slim right now, as far as like where you can eat outside, um, what is your favorite outdoor restaurant to go to lately? My back streets has always been one of my favorites. You know, it's uh, pretty close to the showroom up there. And uh, old Brian just always 
just a lot of pride and great menu, good food. I've, I've never been disappointed there. Yeah, it's, that's definitely one of our favorites. They've, uh, over the years and, you know, with the old building and the new building and, you know, the food's always been really good. And like you said, service, everybody's always really good over that. That's a great, great choice. Yeah. I, you know, I forgot about the old building that, that that's kind of crazy. Uh, how, they, how small that parking lot was. And, yeah. Uh, you used to have to park around the corner sometimes on there. So um, exactly. One other thing. Um, so our, I think our, our go-to place for, for sitting outside has been station. I think it's kind of uh, like uh, the open air over by the, down up by the tracks and stuff. I think that's probably been sure. our, our, our go-to uh, our out, outdoor seating space. I'm still a little bit freaked out about going eat in a restaurant inside just because I've, I've read all this stuff about how the vapors travel and stuff, and I'm not a doctor, but I had I had one on a few months ago uh, on the show, and just uh, so I'm still not ready for indoor dining yet. But you know, try and find as many outdoor places to go to, and if I can't have outdoor, then I try and get takeout from from somewhere. And so, with that in mind, what's your favorite takeout place? Uh, El Paso has always been a, a good one for us. Uh, okay. Get a good old taco salad, and, uh, and and that way I can eat my salad. Nice, that's good. Yeah, we we've enjoyed um, even tap room. Um, they've got a pretty good. Uh, you know, I, I don't again. I, I'm not really eating inside too much, but you can kind of take your food outside on the square. Um, the tap room's been pretty good for for takeout. We've we've been there take got takeout from there a few times, um, and uh, I, my. My Mexican restaurant that I like is uh, Rancho Viejo. We, we we get from there quite a bit, so people oh, listen to the show. Uh, there you go. Know that I uh, that that's probably my favorite restaurant altogether. But uh, anyway, but that's besides the point. Um, all right. So, what is the best TV series you've watched since since March? To be honest, we don't watch a lot of TV, Mike, but we got hooked on the Amazon original miniseries. Uh, Jack Ryan, if, okay. if you're not ready to sit there for several hours on the end, then don't, don't even start it because it, it will keep you on the edge of your seat. It'll force you to binge watch it. You just want to keep watching another episode after. Oh, we, we we did. We watched the whole two seasons in like four nights. Oh wow, that's pretty good. Yeah. How about you? What what is your favorite? I'm trying to think of one that I haven't brought up before. Um, we, we were for a while. We were rewatching The Sopranos. Um, I, you know, we watched that when it first came out, and uh, I'm amazed at how well that holds up. Um, even, you know, even though it's, you know, 15 years old now, basically, um, maybe even more, wow. but, uh, it's actually, yeah, it might be close to 20 years old now. And, but that still just holds up so well, the storyline and the acting and everything on that show, um, just, uh, really holds up. So, uh, but yeah, that's one. And, um, I'm trying to think of, I, I, I wish I could say that. I don't really watch that much TV. I, I don't feel like I watch that much TV, but I, there's always something. We always pick something, and then we'll we kind of go all in with it for a while and, until we're done with it. Um, been watching a lot of house shows. Where you know, since we bought a house recently, uh, you know, we kind of have some renovations and things that we want to do to it. Um, so we've probably I, I've probably been burning up HGTV and. Um, DIY for outdoor stuff because you know trying to get the outside of the house just right and uh, that's probably been where I've probably spent most of my time lately so uh, anyway um, so is there anything that you're looking forward to being able to do once we get let's say hopefully we get to next March and things seem like we're you know it, it feels like a normal March what, what are you looking forward to doing then when, when everything kind of starts feeling like normal again. Mike, I'm, I'm dying for a real live concert. Awesome. Um, we, we've had Alabama tickets to, <laughs> for the kids' graduations. That, that's what we bought them. And uh, it got delayed one time. Randy Owens had some health issues. And uh, then it's got delayed twice more for uh, COVID. So okay. we're, 
really looking forward to just going in here and some good live music. Yeah, I, I, my thing is uh, live sports. I can't get past. I mean, it's nice that some of the sports like the NBA um, has kind of created this bubble situation where there's not really any fans there. And really all the sports are doing it without fans, but the NBA did it's, you know, where they're all in the same place basically. And so that was kind of cool how they did that. Um, but I really miss going to uh, those Hornets games. They're so much fun and the place gets pretty rowdy and, you know, it's so close to the action and everything. So I kind of can't wait to, you know, get back and uh, sit in my seat at the, uh, at that, I guess the, it was Time Warner Cable Arena, but now it's the uh, Spectrum Center and uh, sit in my seat again. Center, I can't wait to yeah. do that, but I, I just miss that so much. Um, I never realized, I mean, I always, we enjoyed it and, you know, we take the kids to the games, you know, from when they were kids and um, just always, it was always a good family fun thing to do. And uh, just really, that's one thing we kind of miss the most right now. But uh, anyway, well, kind of going to wrap up. Um, one, one, I guess I always like to throw out there, is there anything else that you wanted to get out there um, concerning the construction process that maybe we didn't cover that you wanted to make sure everybody got? Uh, Mike, uh, we, we spoke about it a little bit just with, uh, delays on materials, but, uh, it, it is a crazy time in this industry, uh, supply and demand, uh, you, you would have thought COVID would push demand lower, but it, it's out of sight. So, uh, materials are, are going up, uh, the lumber houses are getting, uh, twice a week price increases so uh, just just make sure you plan for that um, you know your builder may ask for escalation calls clause in in contracts and uh, that that's a fair thing to ask you know probably what he'll do is price at this rate with some pad in there, but if it exceeds before we get to this phase, uh, we may have to renegotiate. Um, just, uh, I, I guess that's the, just, just the one thing I, I would convey is supply and demand is still, demand's out the roof. Is it just on lumber or is it just, is it all kind of across the board? Like what's, what's kind of getting the no. biggest hit? Lumber is what I'm seeing by far that two before that six months ago I was buying for three dollars is now almost seven. Wow. Um, so lumber's the biggie. Um, I think it's going to start leveling off here soon, but uh, the past two months it, it has really gone crazy. So mm. I, I hope that'll stabilize. It's just more challenging to operate in this environment. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm not telling folks to hold off on their projects they want to do. I'm just saying you probably need to have more thought and discussion with your builder uh, before you move forward with it. Do you have any idea what they're saying? Um, like the reasoning is just because of demand or is it, is there, um, like a shortage of like trees to cut down or like what, what, what is the cause? Is it purely demand do you think? Or is like the uh, demand uh, and then the, the supply chain trouble? Exactly. Yes. Uh, demand is huge. Uh, who, who would have thought building would be at the increase it, it's at. Um, and, and then you just can't get folks in the mills, the factories, uh, to, to process the goods. Gotcha. That makes sense. Definitely makes sense. So, yeah. All right. Well, so, like, like I said, I don't, don't put off a project that you'd want to do, but just no going in that times are more challenging and, and you need to have probably more robust discussion you know if it was a three dollar two before and it went up to 350 on most projects that's not going to be a huge deal but you know when it doubled and then some um yeah. that's a bigger deal that definitely that'll, that'll hurt so 
Well, Mark, I appreciate you coming on today. I think we had a really good discussion. Um, I'll leave your contact information in the show notes. So if anybody wants to reach out to you, um, you know, feel free. Like I said, uh, Mark's done work for me in the past and done a really good job and we certainly appreciate it. And um, like I said, I think, you know, but you know, not, not for nothing. I mean, we have a lot of really good crash people in our area. And so I, you know, appreciate Mark being able to take his time. I know he's super busy and uh, appreciate taking the time to do this with me. So uh, and thanks. thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, thanks for coming on and uh, see you guys next time. All right. Take care.